Hi there, I'm Ryan, one of the success engineers here at Woopra. This video is part one of a two-part series that will focus on how you can get the most out of Woopra for SaaS businesses. We'll address some common questions related to SaaS businesses and how we can go about answering them in Woopra, along with some best practices around what to track and how best to set up that tracking. We'll also dive into some specific examples and give you some tips on how you can think about the different ways in which you can structure your data and events. I'll link to our SaaS guide as well in our video's description. In part two, we'll focus on how to use and build the reports from the data we've collected. Let's get started by taking a look at 10 common questions you might ask as a SaaS business. Number one, marketing. Whooper can automatically track campaign data, which makes it easy to answer questions like, what campaigns are driving the most traffic and how many of them sign up for a trial? Number two, signups, a key factor for a lot of SaaS companies. They might ask, how many users last month converted to paid subscriptions and what was their continued engagement of the product? Number three, churn, an equally important metric. We can ask, when are users likely to downgrade or cancel their membership after signing up? Number four, growth. We wanna know how much is our MRR or ARR growing month by month? Number five, retention. After a new feature release, how many users are trying it out and do they continue to use the new feature? Number six, issues. Often overlooked, but it's important to know what issues or errors are users encountering when they're trying to sign up. Number seven, search. What are users searching for the most on your site and how can we improve those results? Number eight, support. What impact do certain product features have on my support tickets? Number nine, blogs. An important metric might be what authors are converting the most users. Number 10, satisfaction. If you use NPS scoring, you would likely want to know what product features are used the most among users who leave high NPS scores and what about low NPS scores. All of these questions and more can easily be answered in Woopra. But in order to answer these questions, we have to start with the basics and that begins with the tracking. Having good data is really the foundation for good analysis, so it's definitely not something you want to rush through. To get started with what you should track, we recommend going through your site and start writing down all the entities and verbs or actions that that user can do. For entities, these can be things like dashboards, songs, videos, calendars, really anything that the user can interact with. And on these entities, there might be certain actions you can perform such as create, view, update, delete, share, and so on. For example, if you have a recruiting agency, you would want to track when a user creates a job listing, replies to a post, or even edits a profile. This framework for constructing the verb plus the entity can serve as an outline for the custom actions that you want to track. It's important that you try to follow a consistent naming convention when tracking events. This makes it much easier when building out reports and also helps your team easily identify what these events are. Once you have these events laid out, the next step would be to figure out how to group these events. There can be multiple ways of sending the same event to Woopra depending on how you want to do it. For example, let's say a user can select different types of apples and oranges on your site. When they select the fruit, this can actually be sent in a couple different ways. For one, you can send the event where the event name would be select fruit and the property would be the type and variety. Another way would be to send a different event for each type of fruit. So the event name would either be select apple or select orange and the property for each would simply be the variety. Sending the events using the first model might be optimal because using the second model, you can end up with hundreds of different events in your schema as opposed to just one event, which would be much cleaner. An average target could be in the range of 20 to 30 events, depending on the complexity of the user's journey. So it's really important that you list out the events and their properties in a spreadsheet before you start implementing the tracking. This is to make sure the data structures for the events are well thought out and planned so you can get the most out of the reports you build. Be sure to check out the links in the video's description for an example spreadsheet you can use when laying out your custom events. Next, I want to touch on campaign tracking, which brings us to UTM tags. Since using UTM tags are automatically tracked in Woopra, we advise using them really all the time for any incoming links to your site. 
This will help answer questions like, where are my visitors coming from? How are they finding me? And what happens after they engage with my campaign? So the advice here is again, use UTM tags everywhere. Next, let's quickly break down the code for events sent to Woopra. Looking at this example, first we have the whooper.identify function, which is used to send identifying information on the visitor, such as emails. For sending events, we'll use the whooper.track function followed by the event name and all the properties associated with that event. For more in-depth examples of how our tracking works, be sure to check out our other video that I'll link to in our video's description. We'll now dive into several specific examples of events you can send to Woopra and how these events should be structured. So now that we know the basic structures for the events, let's take a look at our signups. When sending signup events, some common properties could be email, name, username, plan or account level and company names. The code will look something like this. First, we'll send any identifying information such as email, name, username and company in the identify function and for the event, we'll send our signup event as signup and the property will be plan type. Number two, subscription and events. It's important to not only send subscription amounts and payments, but you also wanna send any subscription updates as well. This way you can build reports around changing ARR or MRR. The event will be sent like this, where the event name will be the subscription update. The properties will include old ACV, new ACV, and the delta, which is the difference between the old ACV and the new ACV. So for example, if your old ACV is 10 and the new ACV is 15, the delta would be positive 5. And if they downgrade, you'd have a negative delta. Sending this event with these different properties will also enable you to build retention and churn reports, which I'll demonstrate in the second video in this series. Number three, product usage. Having product usage information will enable you to answer a lot of questions pertaining to retention, churn, adoption, trial statuses, and a lot more. And the tracking is really going to vary since all companies are different. For our example, let's assume you're a recruiting agency and you want to track actions in your recruiting software. Looking at our examples, we can send several different events that the user can do. They can create job listings where the properties can include a title, department, and location. And we also want to track where they update a listing, so we want to make that its own event with the same properties. Lastly, they can contact an applicant, which might have properties like name, phone number, email, and areas of interest. If you have a mobile application as well with the same actions, you can add a property in these events such as Medium that will list web or mobile. And if you have some specific mobile only actions, you could send these events separately and label them like mobile view, mobile load, or mobile contact. SBAs or single page applications can also be tracked. For that, you can add load times like in this example. Tracking this data would be important to see if these load times are impacting conversions or churn. Since there are a lot of potential actions for product usage, this is why it's really important to list out all the items you want to track so you can organize these events in the most optimal way. Number four, one overlooked event might be errors and issue tracking. Sure, the dev team might be alerted of errors on your application, but it's important to see which errors users are experiencing. This can help arm your customer success team with the data to help them provide better service and support. Some of the actions can include form errors, field errors, or various app errors. And with that, this brings us to our next example. Number five, support. Wooper integrates with support tools like Zendesk or Freshdesk so you can see if users are submitting tickets and when they get resolved. Since these are integrations, there's no extra code you need to add to your site. These events will automatically be sent to Woopra and will be added to the schema of events just like you see here. Tracking this data can be useful if you want to analyze the number of tickets submitted after a new feature release or if you want to study the attribution of your CS team to the retention of your customers. Number six, search. If you have some search functionality on your site, this is important to track to get insight into popular content and potential gaps. An example of this event would include the search event, and the properties would be the actual query, the URL, and you want to include the number of results. This way, you can segment searches where users didn't find any results. 
This can be useful to identify opportunities to add content, reach out directly, or even create some automations to trigger an email that could send them additional assistance. Number seven, blogs. Another common entity is blogs. Tracking blog events can give you insight into which blogs are more likely to result in a conversion or which topics or authors are receiving the most attention. This can help guide you in future topics or areas where you need more content. The example code could include events like view article. We can track the title, URL, author, category, and when it was published. Users can also comment on articles, so you can send a comment article event with the properties like the actual comment, article title, and URL. Blog tracking can yield some really helpful insight, so it definitely shouldn't be overlooked. Number eight, satisfaction. Lastly, if you're collecting NPS data from services such as Delighted, we have an integration where you can import this data into Woopra. This can be used to create audiences of promoters and detractors, where you can trigger events to re-engage users or send special offers or promotions. To identify areas of improvement, this data would also be useful to see which features promoters are using the most versus which one detractors are using. And again, since this would be data from an integration, there wouldn't be any need for additional code on your site. So those are just some examples of the various events you can track on your site. We also highly recommend checking out the integrations we offer when setting up your tracking. These won't only help save time, but will help bring additional key data for your analysis. So I hope now you have some idea of what to track and how to think about tracking as a whole. For the next video in this series, we'll dive into how to utilize the data that we're now tracking. We'll explore the different reports you can build with this data and extract insights and answers to our common SaaS business questions. And as always, be sure to check out the links in our video's description for more information and for a link to our SaaS tracking guide. And if you have any questions, you can email us at support at Thanks.